one two of today's lecture for Between War and Peace on Just War Theory. In the first part of the lecture, we looked at the principles of Yusef Berlam focusing on six criteria. These recall concerns when it is permissible to go to war. Now we're going to turn to the principles of Yus in Bello. These concern what states can do during war. So can a war, for instance, be just if it, la responds, if it leads to a large number of civilian casualties? Suppose that NATO were to have intervened in Syria. What means could it use to fight the war? Could it use short range nuclear missiles, cluster bombs, flamethrowers, nerve gas against the Syrian army? Could it use whatever means is necessary to ensure an effective resolution? Two central principles of use in Bala we're going to look at today concerns what we can do during war. These are the ones that most commonly, frequently, mentioned by just war theorists. And for what to be just, it needs to meet these, these two conditions, as well as all of the other conditions of USA Bell. Now, the first principle is the principle of discrimination. On this principle, soldiers must not use force indiscriminately. Rather, they must attempt to discriminate between legitimate and illegitimate targets. Soldiers and civilians, in other words. Watts strongly endorses this principle of discrimination. You see my t-shirt today, I'm a non-combatant, says do not kill. But why is it that soldiers should be legitimate targets? For instance, they might not have any choice but to wage war. They might be conscripted or forced to fight defenders such as, forced to fight dictators such as Saddam Hussein. Walter has a clear answer here. He argues that a soldier is a legitimate target because, he says, he has been made into a dangerous man. And though his options may have been few, it is nevertheless accurate to say that he has allowed himself to be made into a dangerous man. So Walter's reasoning here is that soldiers can be targeted because of the danger that they pose. He's defending in particular what's called the moral equality of soldiers. The moral equality of soldiers. This says regardless of what they are fighting for, soldiers are morally equal. So regardless of whether they're on, for instance, the Nazi side or the Allied side, they're all morally equal. They're all engaged in harm and therefore are all appropriate targets. This means that it's, it's not wrong on this understanding of the principle of discrimination and in particular the moral equality of soldiers to kill soldiers. It's regrettable but not morally wrong according to this understanding of just war theory. What about civilians? This brings us to the second part of the principle of discrimination. Walter and virtually all other mainstream just war theorists endorse the principle of non-competent immunity that says that it's not permissible to intentionally target civilians in warfare. Warfare should be between soldiers. Walter, however, presents a caveat to this principle of non-competent immunity. He endorses what's called the doctrine of double effect. Traditionally, the doctrine of double effect holds that it's impermissible to target directly civilians. But this doesn't mean that it's completely always wrong. It's always wrong to kill civilians. Some civilian casualties are acceptable on this view as collateral damage when the state is aiming at a military target. So even if it's foreseen that soldiers are going to die, this is permissible if the state doesn't target them directly, but is aiming at the military target. So suppose, for instance, you're a state waging a war and you target a convoy of military lorries 
Next to the lorries, these lorries are delivering very important goods to the front line, going to make it much harder if these lorries get their fuel state to win the war. Next to the lorries are civilian cars. In taking out the military lorries, we foresee that doing so will cause some civilian casualties. This is acceptable according to the doctrine of double effect, because the intention is to take out the lorries. It's not to take out the civilian cars. Civilian casualties are an in unintended but foreseen consequence of a legitimate attack on a military target. Now, Waltz's formulation of the doctrine of double effect that you'll find in several accounts of just war theory, Waltz's account formulation is this. There are two effects of an act, a good effect, such as the destruction of the military convoy, and a bad effect, such as civilian casualties. Now, such an act that has this double effect can be permissible if the following conditions are met. Firstly, there is the good effect. It's actually going to happen. It's likely to happen. Secondly, the intention of the actor to achieve the good effect is to achieve the good effect and not to achieve a bad effect. So the bad effect must be unintentional. As I've already said, civilian casualties must be unintended. Thirdly, the good effect must outweigh the bad effect. So, in other words, there must be more good than harm by this particular action during war. So, for instance, blowing up the military lorries might in the end save more lives, despite the fact it causes some civilian casualties here and now. Fourthly, Walter adds a, a final condition that's not found in some of the other accounts of the doctrine of the double effect, and this makes it more restricted. He argues that not only must the intention of the actor be good, the actor, when aware of the evil involved, so basically when aware that there's going to be a bad effect, must seek to minimize it. In other words, seek to reduce how serious this bad effect will be, accepting costs to himself. So for instance, this might mean that if you're bombing a military convoy, you fly lower with the potential risk of being shot down in order to try to avoid accidentally hitting civilian casualties if you can in the cars. Although this might render you more susceptible to ground attack necessary to minimize civilian casualties, accepting costs to oneself in doing so. Now, there are two queries I want to raise with this account of Yusin Bello presented by Walter and characteristic of what's called the traditionalist view of just war theory. First concerns this account of the doctrine of double effect. According to some, this raises, rests on a dubious distinction between what you intend and what you foresee, but do not intend. So take two cases. First, the state intends to attack both an enemy base and a neighboring school. The result is a high number of civilian casualties. Second, a state intends to attack the enemy base and foresees that this result in a high number of civilian casualties, given that there is a school nearby. The state attacks the enemy base regardless and causes the death of a large number of school children. Is there much difference between the two cases? You might think then it doesn't really make much difference to say that a state intends an action compares to merely foresees it. Some think that you should just completely preclude the doctrine of double effect and rule out civilian casualties altogether. So civilian casualties are never permissible. But during the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s, the Bosnian Serbs kidnapped UN soldiers and tied them to bridges in order to deter NATO from attacking these bridges. Meanwhile, Bosnian Serb forces were engaged in mass atrocities in the region. NATO tried to stop this going on. 
we might think that when we need something like the doctrine of double effect in order to find a way around such cases, to be able to destroy bridges to bring about the greater good, still with the right intentions, to be able to wage war justly rather than not at all. The second query, this concerns the principle of discrimination. Now, it's been worried that Walters believed that soldiers, regardless of which side they're fighting on, are legitimate targets. He's claimed that they're legitimate targets. His defense, in other words, of the moral equality of soldiers. Remember, he says they're legitimate targets because they're dangerous. In recent years, there's been a movement in, the, in just war theory called revisionist just war theory. And you'll find that it crops up in quite a lot of the readings. Jeff McMahon is the leading proponent of this form of just war theory. And he presents a twofold challenge to Waltz's claims about the principle of discrimination. Firstly, against this notion of the moral equality of soldiers, he argues that whether it's justifiable to target soldiers depends on whether they are fighting for a just cause. Soldiers that are fighting for a just cause are not, he argues, legitimate targets. It would be wrong, for instance, to deliberately target UN peacekeepers. They're morally innocent, they're doing nothing wrong, and killing them would be akin to murder. It would violate their right not to be killed. On the other hand, soldiers that are fighting for unjust causes, fighting in unjust wars, are legitimate targets. By fighting for unjust wars, they lose their rights not to be killed. On the position that McMahon defends then, it was justifiable for the Allied forces to kill the soldiers fighting for, Allied Ger for, for Nazi Germany, since the Nazi soldiers were fighting an unjust war but on the other hand, it was not justifiable for the Nazi soldiers to kill allied soldiers. So against the moral equality of soldiers, it's not a blanket permission that Mann argues to be able to kill any soldier. It doesn't depend on whether simply they're dangerous. It's only permissible to kill enemy soldiers, soldiers on the other side, when they are fighting for an unjust cause, when they're waging an unjust war. If your side is waging a, a just war, your soldier should be viewed as immune from attack, not liable to attack. Second challenge McMahon makes is this. He challenges the principle of non competent immunity. McMahon interestingly argues and provocatively argues that it might be legitimate to target certain civilian casualties. Certain civilians, sorry. Specifically, it's acceptable to target civilians such as politicians who are morally liable for the war. It gives the example of the United Fruit Company in Guatemala in the 1950s. The directors of the company feared that the democratically elected government's intention of purchasing uncultivated land from the company and redistributing it to the Native American and redistributing it to Native American peasants. They pressurized very heavily the US government, who then through the CIA overthrew the democratic government of Guatemala. McMahon argues that although they were civilians, if attacking the directors of the United Fruit Company would have been effective as attacking soldiers in the pre preventing the coup, then it would have been permissible to do so. So McMahon's challenging Walters' account of discrimination. He argues that what counts as a legitimate target depends on whether the individuals involved are fighting or pursuing a just cause. So on the one hand, you can target soldiers. You can't target soldiers that pursue a just cause. On the other hand, if the civilians are heavily involved in contributing to the pursuit of an unjust cause, they can be legitimate targets. And this contravenes the principle of non competitive immunity as it is normally understood. Now, one concern that's been raised 
very frequently against revisions just what theory and McMahon's arguments and the arguments of other revisionists is that they are dangerous. So traditionalists, Michael Walzer and others have responded that even if we remove if we remove the blanket prohibition, prohibition on targeting civilians, then many more civilians will die as soldiers mistakenly judge the moral innocence of civilians. They would simply guess that civilians are in fact morally legitimate targets when they're not. They'll not understand what civilians have actually been doing. Civilians might have been trying to preclude wars. So the response runs, we need to maintain the principle of non combatant immunity in practice given these dangers. Given the dangers of the fact that they're it's likely to be abused. Now, it's important to emphasize a caveat here. McMahon agrees to some extent with this response. He thinks that his account of revision is just for theory should be part of what he calls the deep morality of warfare. In other words, it's an account of thinking about it philosophically or in principle. He argues that when we come to think about the laws that should govern warfare, we should still maintain non combatant immunity for the sorts of reasons that Walter and others have presented the dangers, the risks of abuse. Second query to these revisionist arguments, questions to these revisionist arguments. For revisionists, war isn't simply wrong because it harms innocent civilians, it's also wrong because it's likely to harm innocent soldiers. So if you recall in the first part of the lecture, I looked at all the foreseeable costs of war, thinking about how war might be rendered disproportionate. One of them concerns the internal costs, sorry, the external costs, and, and the other one concerns the internal costs as well, the cost of third parties. Included in this, in the revisionist account, would be the cost to soldiers who are pursuing just wars, just, just, just causes, just wars. So for revisionist just war theorists, war is even worse because soldiers are not morally equal. It's wrong, it's akin to murder to kill soldiers. This adds to all of the other problems of war. Now this is where the query comes in. This might seem to lead to pacifism, the problem is this, or alleged problem is this. The waging of any wars is likely to involve harms to those who are not liable to such harms, such as innocent civilians. On a revisionist approach to just war theory, there are likely to be many non-liable parties. This is because on this view, not only is it wrong to target innocent non-combatants, it's wrong to target innocent combatants, such as those who fight justly on the just side and those who make just contributions to otherwise unjust wars. It's very difficult to ensure that those waging war will target only those who are liable, since it could be difficult to determine who is innocent and to determine that there's no, ensure that there's no harm to innocence. This leads Larry May, who is a contingent pacifist, the form of, endorses a form of pacifism, to argue that even in high-tech wars, those on the just side of war cannot guarantee that they will harm only those who pose an unjust threat. <clears throat> he argues that if what makes wars liable to be attacked is the threat they pose, then fine grained determinations need to be made amongst soldiers and such determinations make support for fighting even just wars where enemy soldiers as well as civilians are normally killed indiscriminately, very difficult to justify because of the concern that those who are innocent won't be killed, are not to be killed. So May's arguing then that it's very difficult if one endorses revision is just what theory, not to end up being a pacifist. How, should, how can we think about this challenge to McMahon's arguments to revision is just what theory? Firstly, one might simply just accept pacifism. Secondly, one might reject revisionism and think that we shouldn't focus on individual liability, one should endorse a traditionalist view of just war theory. There's been a very vibrant debate between revisionist just war theorists and traditional just war theorists 
And traditionalists argue that we should focus much more on collective status, for instance, by being a member of the armed force, along the lines argued by Michael Walzer. You can have a look at Tamara Meisel's recent book, Just War Theory, where she defends a traditionalist view of Just War Theory, and that's on order for the library and is on your handout. Alternatively, one might defend certain rules of thumb. And these rules of thumb can help to guide those using force to identify who is liable and who is not. We might know that one set of people are more likely to be liable than another. McMahon cites the example of the First Gulf War. He says it was reasonable to assume that the Iraqi Republican Guard, a highly paid elite volunteer force, were more responsible for their actions than poorly armed Iraqi conscripts who were forced to fight by, them to, by threats to themselves and to their families. So they can be targeted. So against this pacifist critique, the suggestion is that there can be rules of thumb that can get a better sense of who is sometimes liable to force and who isn't. Okay, let's now move on to the second principle of Isabella. We said quite a lot about the first principle, discrimination with two major elements, the moral equality of competence, principle of non competent immunity. We've looked at the challenges posed by revision is just war theory to this understanding. The next principle is the principle of proportionality. This is about the tactics within war. It says that the means used in a particular instance, in a particular act during war, remember Yusuf Bello is all about the acts during war, need to be appropriate to the target. So for instance, a few lightly armored Taliban, suppose that a few lightly armored Taliban were in a building surrounded somewhere in central Kabul in, during the uh, Afghanistan uh, war. And NATO forces could have entered into the building and arrested them pretty easily. Instead, suppose that they decided to drop a 10 ton bomb on the building, which flattened it. Now, the challenge here is that such a response, such a use of force would be far beyond that's as necessary, disproportionate given the target, given that you could have arrested NATO forces in this, in this example, could have arrested the Taliban um, soldiers. So the principle of proportionality says that the force that needs to be used needs to be proportionate to the threat. You may need to minimize the amount of harm that you do when waging war during particular acts. You don't need to take a hammer to squash a fly, in other words. This is the central principle, second central principle of your symbolo. Use means that are appropriate and not excessive. Okay, let me now summarize. We've been looking at two sets of criteria that according to just war theorists need to be met for any war to be just. These principles concern what happens before war, you said bellum, and what happens during war, you said bellum. There are also conditions of use post bellum, but I haven't said much about these and we're not gonna look at them too much in this module. These criteria are going to be useful for thinking about the alternatives to war in later weeks. But to finish up on the ready to query, this concerns the relevance of just war theory. You might think that no war will ever meet these criteria, or you might think that leaders will never obey them. Instead, leaders are always going to be governed by concerns of the national interest. Always thinking about what they can do to prioritize UK, US, French, Chinese, South African, whatever, interests, so on and so forth. However, you will find that, in fact, many leaders explicitly now and in, in previously have framed their justifications for going to war in terms of just war criteria and just war language. For instance, during Kosovo and Afghanistan wars, as well as in Iraq and Libya, Military spokesmen often use the categories of just war theory to emphasize that they had right on their side. For instance, it was much harder now to envisage, for instance, a general saying, it doesn't matter how many civilians will die. 
what matters is only the military objective. It seems that just war theory permeates much of our practical thinking on warfare. I've got a short video to illustrate this point. And our effort to replace one with the other. Now these questions are not new. War in one form or another appeared with the first man. At the dawn of history, its morality was not questioned. It was simply a fact, like drought or disease. The manner in which tribes and then civilizations sought power and settled their differences. And over time, as codes of law sought to control violence within groups, so did philosophers and clerics and statesmen seek to regulate the destructive power of war. The concept of a just war emerged, suggesting that war is justified only when certain conditions were met. If it is waged as a last resort or in self-defense, if the force used is proportional, and if, whenever possible, civilians are spared from violence. Now, the extent of the use of just war theory politically by leaders has become one of the central critiques of just war theory more generally. And this is that it provides a way for leaders to justify potentially their wrongful, their, unjust, their unjustified wars, to try to legitimize what they're doing. The claim is that just war theory has such a force that enables wars that wouldn't have otherwise be possible because the global public, or domestic publics, endorse something like the general categories of just war theory. Whether that's a fair or not criticism of just war theory is also subject to much debate in the literature. Okay, this brings to the end today's lecture. Next week, we're going to be turning from warfare to the leading alternative to war, economic sanctions. And as we'll see, criticism of economic sanctions invokes some of these notions that we've been looking at today of Yusab Bellum and Yusin Bello uh, in, the, in the critique of economic sanctions. Okay, thank you.